also a little different this year. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a meditation on each candle, and then we'll read the Christmas story, and then we'll have a final meditation and a lighting of the candles. Um, and then dismissal and carrying the light out into the world. Uh, but I just want to start out with the first reading. It's from John 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the message tonight is about peace and goodwill. Um, Luke chapter 2, verses, starting in verse 10, reads this way, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And some of you may know this as, as peace um, with whom he is well pleased, or if you read the, the King James Version, it's glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And that's where I got the title for tonight, is that peace and goodwill. It's a different translation. Um, he took some different source material, or they, they took different source material from the King James, but it summarizes it so well. That night, when the angel appeared to those shepherds, they offered peace and goodwill to the people who would choose Jesus. Uh, the power of the nativity, you know, if, if you think about it, maybe you grew up like I did and you had a, a favorite nativity. If you look around the church, there's probably four or five, six of them around the church. But the power of the, the nativity, the power of that image of the baby Jesus and of those animals uh, is peace and goodwill. And so much focus right now is on you know, conflict and turmoil in the world. If you think about what 2020 has been like, you know, we all came in here and now it's cold and it's 2020. Um, I, I noticed that even the announcer on the Christian radio station was sounding kind of, uh, kind of emo, yeah, a little, <laughs> little dark. He, he was talking about 2020 and then I think he was trying to preach about, uh, about God being with us. But our focus tonight, as we look at, at what each of these candles means, there was conflict and there was turmoil surrounding the image that each of these candles presents. And I want us to think about that and then think about what's offered. The fact that what is offered is peace and goodwill. And peace and goodwill, it comes from a child born and resting in a manger. So the first candle, I could probably look at Wes. He could probably tell me what the first one is. Prophecy. Prophecy, yeah, the candle of the prophets. It, and the prophecy that we often look towards when we think about this candle, it comes from Isaiah, it's in, in chapter 7. And the conflict that was happening at that time, it was just before the Babylonian conquest and just before the Babylonian exile. Uh, the, the people of God, you know, the Hebrews, uh, the Israelites and the Judeans, they had really fallen short. And Babylon was sweeping in and about to take over. And Isaiah was speaking into that context at the time. It was during the reign of Ahaz and he was disobedient to God. And Isaiah was proclaiming judgment on, on Ahaz. And he said, you know, you're distant from God, therefore, or you are disobedient to God, therefore, you are distant from God. And he says this, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So in the middle of this conflict and turmoil, he gives this prophecy of peace. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So there's disobedience, imminent judgment, and yet he says your Savior is going to come, and that word Emmanuel means God with us. He's going to be an imminent God. He's going to abide and offer deep fellowship to those who choose him. He's going to be a God who gives up his divine privilege. Philippians 2, uh, starting in verse 5, says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So that idea of God with us was present when Isaiah prophesied in the midst of all this conflict and turmoil. And that idea of God with us was present from the very beginning. It was present in the garden. It's been a constant theme of God. That was the original intent. 
that we should live in his presence in a place of abundance, that we should grow and be nurtured by him and grow up into what we're fully intended to be. And then when we failed, he kept offering it again and again, offer to be God in the midst of his people. And here we have Isaiah offering it, and then we have Paul describing exactly what the heart of Jesus was, that he would set aside his divinity and come and live among us, that he would be born into a manger. So there was conflict and turmoil, yet God comes offering peace and goodwill. The second candle. Does anybody? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, yes. I'm just going to rely on Wes. <laughs> So it's the candle of Bethlehem. And of course that's because Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem. It was foretold. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 2 verse 4 says this, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Ju Nazareth and Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So it was foretold that Jesus would come from Bethlehem. It was part of a prophecy. And again, this prophecy was spoken into the midst of turmoil. Uh, Micah 5.2 says this, But you, Beth Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And here we have Micah speaking into the Assyrian conquest. There were two major conquests of Israel. There were two major conquests of the Holy Land. One was the Babylonian conquest, the other was the Assyrians. And they were at the doorstep, and the king was hiding in his city. And yet into this, Micah says, a savior will be born to you out of the city of Bethlehem. And Bethlehem literally means house of bread. We had a whole sermon on, on, on what that possibly meant to them, the fact that, um, that it was a place of, of abundance and of crops and they were known for their bakeries. Um, but Jesus lays claim to all the meaning and intent that's held in that. In John chapter 6, he says this, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. You know, each time we break bread at communion, we recognize that that bread represents Jesus' body broken on the cross. It's a reminder that he is the bread from heaven. It's a reminder that he's the one who sustains us. Just like that man has sustained God's people in the wilderness, Jesus is the one who sustains us now. And when our body fails, he's the one who will sustain us into eternity. He is the bread of life. So there was conflict and turmoil around the prophecy and the foretelling that he would come from the town of Bethlehem. And yet, he offered peace and goodwill. Angels? Almost. <laughs> Shepherds. I love putting people on the spot. It's good, good fun. <laughs> when we look at shepherds, uh, there's a long history of shepherds in Scripture. There's a long history of shepherds with God's people. You know, if you think back, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, all shepherds. You look at Moses, a shepherd. David himself was a shepherd. And when you really think about it, they were all flawed and broken people. They are heroes of our faith, but they were far from perfect. And there was conflict and turmoil surrounding them. You know, Moses became a shepherd in Midian, and the way he started was the killing. The way he started, uh, the Pharaoh had become paranoid about the number of Israelites in his land, and he was afraid that they would rise up. They had outnumber the, the uh, Egyptians, and so he set about to kill all the firstborn, all the young, uh, young Israelites in the land. And that was a foreshadow of what would then happen 
in Jesus' day. Um, we pick up in Matthew chapter 2. It says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take this child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and during the night they left for Egypt. And there he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So amongst those shepherds, amongst God's people, we have Moses, who was born into similar circumstances. And he was a foreshadowing of who Jesus would be. And of course, he was, he was born into that. Uh, he was taken into Pharaoh's house as an orphan. And then when he grew up and began to understand who he was, he stepped out as a flawed leader. He started out with murder and with exile. He became zealous for the abuse that his people were, were, uh, were under, the yoke that they were under, and he struck down one of, the, one of the taskmasters. And then he was exiled, and he went into the land of Midian, and that's where he became a, a, uh, became a shepherd. He was imperfect. He was meek in speech. When God called him, he didn't want to step forward. I, I can relate to that. I get nervous if you didn't catch me stumbling occasionally here. Um, he was prone to anger, coming off the mountain. Coming off the mountain, seeing what his people had done, seeing what the Hebrews had done in building the golden calf, he cast down the tablets of the covenant. He was flawed. So he lived his days dealing with slavery or dealing with wilderness wandering. David was a shepherd boy, and he started out with conflict. The first we hear of David has to do with a sling. It has to do with warfare. and has to do with striking down Goliath. And then he had conflict with Saul. When the time came, Saul became paranoid about his military exploits, about David's military exploits, and was afraid he would become more popular. And there was turmoil there, until finally Saul was struck down. And then David ascended to the throne, and he was guilty of adultery and of murder. And he continued to have warfare throughout his reign. But instead of a flawed shepherd, we're given a good shepherd. In John 10, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not, own, does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And when the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So along with this candle of the shepherds, there was conflict and there was turmoil. And yet, God offers peace, and goodwill. And finally, we have the angels. And we see the angels in this story. We see the angels in the Christmas story, and they come bearing these messages. And they come bearing messages of hope. They come to Elizabeth, they come to Zechariah, they come to Mary, they come to Joseph. But when we look at who angels really are, there's conflict involved. The very first account of an angel that we have, if you look at it in a time sense, in Revelation it tells us about Michael in the fight against Satan and casting Satan and his angels from heaven. And that was before the beginning, that was before Genesis, that was before the creation of the heavens. We find angels guarding God's presence. And they're not those warm and fuzzy images that we think. They're militant. The cherubim that was placed at the, at the gate of the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword to keep people out of God's presence after they had sinned. We have cherubim in other images. We have cherubim in, uh, in Ezekiel's vision of God. And, and they're fearsome images. We see images of angels fighting our battles. We see images of angels in Elisha's, uh, Elisha's fight against the nations around him. There was a, an account in 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha is in the city and the city is surrounded. And he gets up in the morning and his servant sees all the people surrounding the city and he's afraid. And Elisha play, prays that his servant's eyes will be opened. And when he looks up, he sees chariots of fire surrounding the city. And Elisha says, those who are for us are more than those against us. 
So even with the candle of angels, there is conflict and turmoil surrounding everything that we know. As a matter of fact, angels are active in fighting our battles. And so often we forget that as well. Ephesians 6 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, heavenly realms. That comes right in there in the context of putting on the full armor of God and praying, right? And asking God to come in and do for us. But what's being said here is there's a battle raging around us. And it's a battle for our souls. It's a battle for our eternity. It's a battle for the people around us. And if we've accepted God, perhaps that battle's won for us, but there are others that the battle's being fought for. And finally, we see angels in the book of Revelation ushering in the end of the age. We see Michael fighting the final battle against Satan and his, um, his forces. And we see the angels rolling out and casting judgment upon the earth before the final end comes. So there is conflict. There is turmoil when we think about angels. There were messengers in the Christmas story, though. Gabriel coming and saying, A child will be born to you. When we think about it, the word angel itself actually means messenger. Jesus himself was the greatest message we could ever receive. And Jesus was the greatest messenger. Because in that brief span, those three years where he ministered on this earth, he told us so much about who we were intended to be and who we can be again. So there was conflict and turmoil, and yet God came offering peace and goodwill. The center candle is the Christ candle. representing the light of Jesus entering into the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through, though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Whatever conflict, whatever turmoil, God has overcome it and He offers peace and goodwill. I'd like to read the Christmas story. Uh, I, I always love that on Christmas Eve. And then uh, we have a final meditation and lighting of the candles. From Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring to you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those with whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. 
as we come to our final meditation, I'm going to... All the prophecies have been fulfilled. And maybe the candles will go out. <laughs> yeah. And bring down the lights. You may have found the votive candles in front of you. I should have had you grab those before I shut off the lights. <laughs> we, we talked about our usual um, having the candles and lighting them and spreading them around. And um, Somebody made the comment we could turn towards a neighbor and blow them out. Uh, and it was mentioned to do little votives like this. And I thought, well, I don't know. It's not the same thing. And then it occurred to me um, that you can carry this light out into the world with you. But to finish up... I want to share a, uh, a meditation that I heard earlier this month. I was on a, uh, it was a, a nationwide uh, phone conference, um, and it, it was on the Army side. It was on the chaplain side of things. And they always are kind of careful about how they phrase things because people come from different faith backgrounds. But you could hear in, in what was being said that these people were actually Christians. And uh, I'm not usually into visual, visualization exercises, but this one hit me as profound. And I thought, well, maybe it's just me. And then I heard this command sergeant major on the other end going, wow. Um, so I've unabashedly stolen and adapted it for our use. But I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to take just three deep breaths. all the while imagining a child lying in a manger. Now, on this Christmas Eve, in this holiday season, I want you to imagine setting a table. It's a holiday table. It was for a small gathering. And I want you to think back to someone you've known in your life living or past, who's had your best interest at heart. Once you know who that is, imagine them seated at the table. Now ask them, do you love me? Next, I want you to picture yourself. And don't picture yourself in this moment. Don't picture yourself in the year 2020. Picture who you are at your essence, who it is that God created you to be, who he knit you in your mother's womb to be, who you will be when you are raised up and in his presence at the resurrection. And invite yourself to the table. And ask, do you love me? And now as you picture this table, I want you to invite God to the table. I suspect invariably you're imagining Jesus. And as he sits at the table, I want you to ask, do you love me? You know the answer. And as a final question, you can ask him, what do you need me to know for this season and stepping into this new year? May your Christmas gift is to know that God loves you. His love for you is superior to all others. It's superior even to your own love for yourself. He will meet you when you call out to him. And if he has something to say when you sit with him at the table, his Holy Spirit will speak to you. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. If you haven't already, turn on your candles and open your eyes. The power of this one is you can take it with you. 
we use the regular candles, we have to blow them out and we have to set them in a box at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, but you can take this one with you as a reminder that the light of Christ is with you always. Mine's probably going to go on the uh, console of my car. As most of the regulars know, I'm at my least Christian when I'm driving. <laughs> I invite you to put yours somewhere where it will serve as a reminder. You know, if it's on the windowsill where you look out when you drink your morning coffee, whatever it is you do, place it somewhere as a reminder. It's, it's a silly little thing, and if it gets broken, it's fine. But it can be a reminder this week. The light of the world has come, and he's with you, and he lives within you. And he offers you peace and goodwill. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the season. And we thank you for the beauty of this night. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate it. This world has existed in, in turmoil and confusion from the very beginning because the hearts of mankind are corrupt. We ourselves have participated in that. We ourselves have contributed. And yet, Lord, you came to us offering peace and goodwill. You bridged a gap by sacrificing yourself on a cross. You poured out your Holy Spirit upon us so we could carry this light into the world. And Lord, you give us these remembrances so that in the midst of uncertainty, we can be islands of calm. We can carry your mercy and grace. We can be your hands and feet. We can be your voice. We can serve in ways we've never earned or deserved. So we thank you, Lord, for this night. May your blessing rest upon each one here. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas, and may the living God bless and keep you. May his peace and goodwill rest upon you and your loved ones this holiday season.